thanks very much, and uh, thanks for inviting me. For me, it's actually the perfect time to review each of my undergraduates because it's almost exactly 25 years since I first brought PC Gift as a vehicle for teaching econometrics, and just over 20 years, 21 years, since I actually wrote an article about how to do it in PC Gift. And I looked back to see the changes, and they're really enormous. They're almost as big as jumping from maths and blackboards in the 1970s to what we had 21 years ago. And we now have this uh, jump, new econometric modelling textbook that we hope will radically alter how you do econometrics. And the reason I was willing to come and talk at John's invitation <laughs> is precisely because we've, we've really adopted a very different approach to the discipline now. So we don't expect our students to know anything about statistics when they start, and we expect them to confront multivariate co-integration in the face of non-stationary data when they finish in one year. And that's the aim, and that's what we get them to do. And I want to explain to you how we do it. I obviously can't do that in detail in 40 minutes or whatever John is eventually going to let me have. And it also has to be remembered, we are getting not very mathematically oriented students into PPE. We're changing that radically, and over the next five years, PPE will become vastly more mathematical because of changes in the syllabus. Nevertheless, when I took over with Bent eight years ago with six students doing econometrics, and it's an optional paper, and now there's 48 choosing to do it, and that's word of mouth amongst the students about how exciting it is to do it. So what do we do? The key thing is we teach everything in terms of likelihood. We don't introduce any other statistical method. It's just a waste of time talking about GMM and least squares and IV or whatever. You want to get them to understand likelihood in the simplest possible case and the whole of econometrics becomes an open door. Secondly, it's very closely tied to relevant empirical applications and I'll spend more of my time on that today than on the theory, which is all very boring. They've got to master software, but PC Give is really easy to master. They get to use it very quickly and they become real experts before they finish. We spend a huge amount of time in graphics. I find students' command of graphics is unbelievably awful. I do not know how they pick up and read newspapers. Even high quality undergraduates like Oxford PPEists in their third year, if you put a graph up, they do not actually understand what it's telling them at all. Not in the slightest. And this is very worrying because only 48 out of 250 do our course. And finally, we really emphasize there's no point in putting up the kind of garbage that we see in the ADR and JPE. We want them to do proper, serious econometrics. So they're really emphasizing rigorous evaluation of everything we do. Then we introduce derivations when we get to the point. Right? They move on to a new model. We explain roughly how to do that. So how do we do it? Well, we begin with IID, independent, identically distributed, binary variables, boys and girls at birth. What's the sex ratio? How do you model that? The simplest imaginable case. We build that up into a Bernoulli model with random draws. We explain the difference between the sample and the population, which, of course, is deliberately most difficult for births because you've got the population of all the births, but that's the sample of all the possible births, and they can get that idea quite quickly. And that leads to discussing distribution functions and densities. I just look at the two pile-ups, which are about 50-50 for boys and girls, a few more boys and girls in average. Then we can discuss inference. How would you test whether the sex ratio is equal, for example? And they begin to get the idea. It's an interesting hypothesis. Why are there more boys than girls? Is, is it you know, a China problem, so to speak? Or is there something else going on out there that boys just have a slightly higher probability because they've got a lower life expectancy? Then that leads us to discuss expectations and variances, which again are dead easy in a binary IID model. And, of course, we then discuss what would happen if we've only got whatever it is, uh, half a million of each or something. What would happen if you had 500 million of each or a billion or 500 billion and get them to think about asymptotics and convergence and distribution right at the outset. So this is about lecture three. <laughs> And although they're not mathematical, because we're not writing down PLM of this, that, and the next thing, but getting them to think, using Monte Carlo methods in particular, to draw huge samples and let them see what happens as the sample gets bigger and bigger, and how it converges to the population probabilities, which are 
P, minus, one minus P, and that's the only thing of interest. Then we go on to introduce continuous variables. We look at wages of women in the US relative to education and age and things like that. But the simplest regression you can run is Y and a constant and an error, which of course is pretty covered. They know how to estimate the mean. So now you introduce regression as estimating a mean, not as a new concept in any sense, than likelihood for the mean, this is likelihood for the mean, but we now have <coughs> it as a regression equation. And that leads into logic regression, bivariate regression models without any difficulty. Now, while that's going on, which Bent's mainly doing, I'm teaching them how to look at data. We have this huge data bank up on our website, a long historical time series, built by many famous people over the last 40 years, going back to 1860, a large number of macroeconomic time series. And we use that, and we give the students the choice of one of them, the class votes for the article on unemployment, inflation, real wages, or GDP. I'm going to assume that they choose unemployment for this particular exercise, but they get to choose, and I don't care which. And then we start discussing graphs. What's an axis? What is units of axis? What are the data transformations of that? Unemployment rates. An enormous transformation of the number of people unemployed, for example. We need to understand that in the scaling. The role in property of logs, if it's delta P, for example, the change in price, log of price. <coughs> then we discuss salient features, major event cycles, trends, breaks. And of course, one look at the data, and you get the students to start commenting on what's there. We want students who, when they see such graphs, which they never will in the ADR and the JPE, and they won't even get the data from authors in general, but if they're reading decent journals, they'll get to see graphs of the data, and they'll be able to realize what the problems are. And you can't finesse such problems if these kids are going to go on and do anything. So there's the graph of their employment rate. <coughs> And we get the students to discuss it. I go, you, 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 say something about it. We go right around the class, and everybody's got to say something. The entire 48 in the class. And as it goes around the class, it gets harder and harder to come up with something <laughs> original. <laughs> so they're very pleased to be at the beginning. So let's actually do that. So we've now moved into the actual program we use. I've just drawn the graph to get us going. And we expect them to say, well, actually, it looks kind of different here from here and here, and it's going up and down, and it's low here, and it's high here, and so on and so forth. That's all we're really expecting for them to do. We'll come back to that in a moment. So there's the graph. And then you try to relate it. Well, how would you like to live in the 1930s? Would you like to be one of the 15% unemployed? Would you rather be in the 1940s, where it's a quarter of a percent? You get them to think about the econometrics in relation to life and what it's going to mean for them to keep their interest up. Now, in fact, however often I tell the class the first thing you say about any graph is what are the axes, it takes four to five weeks before some bright spark says, oh, the axes are, you know, the fraction of the population unemployed or whatever. So here's the sort of general comment you get out of them. I've drawn in the mean over what I would call historical epochs. This is the business cycle epoch. This is the catastrophic interwar unemployment epoch. This is the post-war reconstruction epoch. And this is the uh, post-all crisis epoch. And you can see they're hugely different. The means are changing. Big upward mean shift and probably increased the variance. Dramatically lower mean and a dramatically lower variance. And then we get back up to 1930s style stuff. And they're expected to discuss this, the units, the dates, and comments and things. And then we get down to specific comments. You know, why does it look like this? Why is it down here? What's happening here? What's this like? Why is this jumping up? Why does this come crashing down? What's going on down here? What happened here? Who was running the government to cause such a chaos in the economy? And so on. <laughs> what happened when we left the ERM? Some of them know little bits of economic history, but most of them don't know nearly enough to realize that the, the shapes are actually nothing to do with economics. That's the first thing we want to get across. This is not economics. This is all sorts of other things going on in the world. Some of them are related to economics, like crashes, and but there are wars, for the most part, as you can see, going on. Secondly, we want them to realize means and variances shift. And they need to know that right at the outset. There's no point in thinking they can model stationary data in some crazy way by running constant parameter regressions. One look at that. And you realize you cannot, in general, hope to describe this with a nice simple, uh, say, autoregression over the whole period or something like that. So, 
Then we move on to the change in unemployment. This is to get them to think about the fact that, you know, you can transform data in a good level. So just that price, it's the price level and the rate of inflation. So changes in unemployment. And you can see it's a huge shift, even in changes. You often read still the articles in AER saying, oh, we different states of stationary. And not stationary, gigantic changes in the variance up to 1945 and after 1945. And even within epochs, there's quite big changes in the variance of the first difference, as you can see. And often the changes look pretty close to random, a small amount of cyclicality in the changes, but not much from the actual data. So we try to get those ideas across. Then we set up the notion of, you know, you've seen the distribution of this stuff. I haven't actually plotted that here. Uh, let's let's do the distribution of unemployment. That gives them the distribution of the unemployment rate, and they can see that it's sort of got a long right tail, quite a short left tail, because because unemployment can never go below zero, and you get some smart guys beginning to say, aha, so what is this out here? You know, what's this doing saying you could get negative unemployment? And you begin to realize you've got them thinking, which is the first step towards them doing anything useful. Then they can see that it's not going to be well modeled by normal, but nevertheless you say, okay, it's too bad, we're going to model this by normal distribution. <laughs> this you tell them standard practice, you look at the distribution, you smile, and you move on. So, <laughs> we're going to set this up as a bimetic normal. We're going to explain that linear regression is conditioning the bimetic theory of normal. This just goes back to elementary probability. You write down probability, you write down conditional probability, you look at the normal, you write down the conditional probability of y equals x and the normal, and lo and behold, you've got y equals x beta plus alpha plus an error. And they're suddenly realizing, aha, yeah, we did that a little while back with y equals beta plus u, but now there's an x in there. So this leads naturally to all sorts of areas. You can go in different directions. We spend a lot of time in, what does a linear regression mean? Is it unique? Are there many other things that look like linear regressions, like best-fitting lines, like uh, non-linear approxim linear approximations to non-linear things, like behavioral models, conditional models, all of that comes in here. And that leads to discussions about modeling and model design, which of course we're also doing, as you'll see in a moment, in the applied side for them, that yes, it looks like you can uh, run a regression for unemployment, but what would it mean? You know it's not normal. And that's the reason for doing it at this stage. So if you run a regression, it cannot be because it's conditioned in a normal. But you can still run a regression. So you get the idea that there's sorts of other ways of thinking about models. Then we discuss how do we judge a model, and that leads to congruence and encompassing. Congruence, the property that, as you know from mathematics, you take two triangles, and the triangles are congruent if they fit exactly on top of each other. But nobody told you this is a million-dimensional pyramid underneath, and all you're matching is your triangle to the top of the pyramid. You're not matching the million other dimensions. And congruence is like that. A model is congruent where it matches the data. And it may be non congruent and other aspects you've not looked at. And encompassing is its ability to explain other people's results. So, two routes to go. You can either get them to come up with theories of unemployment, which we tend to leave slightly later in the course, but some years we do it early, some years later. Instead, I'm going to get them to look at a particular theory of unemployment that the economy has an equilibrium steady state growth path, and it's given by the real interest rate that is the long the console rate minus the rate of inflation of GDP minus the growth rate of GDP is equal to this variable. An equilibrium path is that this real variable equals zero everywhere. So the next task is to graph it. Get them to look at two graphs at once rather than one graph at a time. So here's the graph of the real rate and the change in GDP. And then here's the graph of unemployment and this measure, that's the unemployment in red, and this measure of deviation from the steady state growth path. So the basic idea being that if the real rate of capital exceeds the growth rate, which is probably the rate of profit, then companies don't invest, and when it's less, they do invest, and that's what's determining or driving unemployment. 
It's very good in the 19th century. It's moderately good in the interwar period. Then, yeah, the interwar period. And then it breaks down a bit later, as we'll see. But it's, it's a good starting point. So, we've now explained regression. So we can do a regression plot. We can graph the unemployment rate against the equilibrium rate to see what happens. We can discuss these squares and explain the slope and graphs. But there are many key concepts underpinning linear regression. And as ever, we go straight in and confront them. There's no point in trying to explain regressing one induction is variable and another without explaining them what we're doing. So we discuss its homogeneity, we discuss the properties about the errors, we discuss the distribution of shapes of the errors, we discuss the functional form of the relationship, and we discuss parameter constancy. And as you go through our book, you'll see even for the simplest model, every one of these issues is addressed for every model. So they become commonplace for the student to think about them all. So here's the regression of UR and RY, the scatter plot that goes up. Then we draw the regression to the projections and explain this is what least squares would be minimizing the square deviations. You can also draw the slope and intersect things in the graph. It's very easy to do that. And if I had more time, I'd actually go ahead and do it. Um, then let's just see how easy it is. Next stage is to get the mathematics behind that into them. So we looked at the data. That's the first thing we did. We saw one data. We then suggested a possible data generation process in relation to unemployment and the equilibrium steady state growth path. We then set up a model of that probability distribution function. Okay, we took normality, and they know that's wrong, and we know we're going to come back to it, but for the moment, we're taking this normal. We write down the likelihood function. We always do that. We maximize it. We derive the statistic, which, of course, is just equating the first derivative to zero in a scalar. We then derive its distribution, which with regression you're all familiar with, it's approximately normal, the third line going is normal. We then apply that to data, we interpret the results, and then we evaluate the findings. And this is repeated all the time, just around the cycle. They don't notice that's what we're doing, right? So they say, hey, we've done all this already, it's very boring. It's, there's too many steps involved for them to actually interpret it. So we've done, as I mentioned, reinterpreting estimation of a mean section of intercept, leading the way to regression. And now we set up a regression model, and I'm not going to do it today, but we switched to a very different set of data collected by Katie Grady in the Fulton Fish Market, which she uh, embeds and anchors to analyze as if it's cross-section, although in fact it's a time series. We then explain how to run cross-section regressions for them. That also leads us to introduce the concept of simultaneity. There's a price in the fish market, there's a quantity in the fish market, and they realize they need to model both. And running a regression of price and quantity, you could run it the other way, or maybe there's two things going on. That leads to the concept of identification. We can then explain, because we've got the likelihood function, we can discuss the fact whether or not the likelihood is going to be top to model. That leads to identification. Again, not much mathematics, as you'll see when you read the book. And that then, because we've now got a system of two variables, leads to the concept of co-integration. Are they holding together in the long run? Now, in fact, this data is stationary. So it's quite good to introduce co-integration as the link between two stationary variables, because that's what holds in the long run, but indeed for the stationary time series. We can also introduce things like instruments and structural breaks in this case, because the only way to identify when it's a cross-section, the two equations, is to use weather as an instrument for moving the supply equation and holidays as an instrument for moving the demand equation. And they happen to be very well measured. So you get really good instruments which are in fact equivalent to structural breaks because you get big jumps in the quantity supply when there's a hurricane at sea. You don't get any fish in the market, right? And it's lovely weather, you get lots of fish in the market. And when it's Christmas Day, the market's not trading. Right? And so on. You get quite big shifts. So the day before, people are piling into the market to buy the fish for their Christmas dinner or whatever. So each topic leads straight through into the next. Now, I'm not going to look at that data today. The next thing we get them to do is we want to demystify regression. All these kids of regression, gosh, it's a big complicated thing, all statistics and very difficult. So we get them to write their signature and then run a regression through their signature. When they finish that, they no longer think regression is some fancy device that only top statisticians can do. So the first thing we need is to draw a line. 
to draw a freehand line, and then I need to draw my signature, which I'm still not very good at after years of practice. But there's my signature, kind of Picasso's logo and my lovely picture. Then I want to edit it and run a regression. So let's pick a regression, number of lines one, sequential with projection, so you can see if you can even take projections about it. Pick a nice lurid color, purple would be just fine. Nice pink thick line, bulk, done. Here's a regression to my signature. <laughs> now, of course, they immediately get intrigued. How could you do that? Right? And that's what you want them to be. You want them to be intrigued. What's going on here? How can this guy write? I mean, they, they get everyone in the room to do it. Right? They're all doing it. They're all sitting at computers, remember, all the way around the room doing this. And how they do it, of course, is dead simple. Pixels are what are measured in the graph. When I draw my signature, they connect to a pixel. But I know the world coordinates of each pixel from the state of the unemployment relationship. So it can then calculate the world coordinates. Knowing the world coordinates, it can read the data. That it can run regression. They suddenly realize that regressions are very simple, rather trivial device, and projections are dead easy, they're just how far from the line. And you often get them writing their signature in the next few graphs and playing themselves. That's quite good for they miss key points about it. Concepts and models and valuation. <laughs> so the next thing to introduce them to as well, we have one regression. Is that a good idea? Do you really think from 1860 to 2006 can be described by one simple regression of one variable unemployment where there was no unemployment insurance, no national health, no nothing back in 1860s, trade union membership that wasn't national unemployment? Millions of things have changed. Will one do, or do we need many? Well, let's look at many. Uh, you can see that what's actually happening is it's fantastically good in the tails. And in the middle, it's a random shambles, right? There's nothing going on in the middle. Uh, oops, we've already done those. That's what it looks like with 10. Same thing, two in the tails, fantastic. Different slopes, that's something they might clever student might find out. The ones in here, is this structural break? Is a random sampling? Could you imagine a world in which you actually drew data from a common data generation process and you saw this coming out? So they get the concept of population and sample back again in a completely different framework. Okay, now we're going to look at other parts of distribution. We've already looked at the distribution of shape. We've seen this one. What's interesting is the shape, the change in unemployment which is, of course, very close to normal, apart from a couple of outliers, the First World War and the post-war reconstruction booms, and the start of the Second World War, where you get really low levels, big changes down here, and the interwar period, the 1922 crash, big levels. There. <coughs> so, we can now ask the question, well, we know these aren't random. <laughs> you saw the graph of that. Business cycles, big peaks, low troughs, etc. So we've drawn the histogram, and of course we can discuss kernels if you're a slightly more mathematical group. It's dead easy. We've done histograms at school. So they kind of get the idea of a smooth histogram. And they realize they're pretty iffy things since they've got negative unemployment. Here it's working a lot better uh, in describing it. And we can ask the question, is there randomness? And that introduces autocorrelation and brings in time to the core. Now, if you look at the correlograms, for example, this is the correlogram for the unemployment rate. And we've discussed correlations. We know that's a correlation between you today and you a year earlier, two, three, four years earlier. So it's not very difficult to get the concept of a correlogram into their heads once they understood a correlation. And then for this one, they begin to see that the changes in unemployment are totally surprising. Right? Not, not predictable from past unemployment to any extent. These are the confidence bands, and it's pretty much like white noise, so you go to Monte Carlo, you get them to make white noise, you get them to graph it, you get them to accumulate white noise, you get them to graph the parallelogram. Ooh, that looks like accumulation of that one. And they begin to get the notion of integrated time series without you yet having introduced any concepts of mathematics, stochastic processes, or anything. They're beginning to realize you can go from here to here, but you can also go from here back up to there. Okay, so it's a two way mapping. Then you can get them to run a regression. This is a regression of unemployment and unemployment lag, and this is a regression for change in unemployment and the change in unemployment lag. 
they can now connect the slope of the line to the correlation. And the fact that there was no correlation is consistent with the fact that this line is pretty close to flat. So that's another idea in the little heads. So now we go back and run the long run stroke, later seen as co-integrated relationship. Because unemployment is non-stationary, highly non-stationary. But it's not co-integrated, because clearly you can't get 50 million percent unemployment or minus 10 percent unemployment. But it's close enough to being non-stationary that this makes some sense. So we just estimate the static regression log what we saw graphically, go back and look at the graph and relate it to. And then we explain that this shows that when the real interest rate is above the real rate of return and capital unemployment is up, the equilibrium rate of unemployment, so that's going to mean of zero, it's five percent. And you then go back and look at 5% unemployment in history. We then discuss the goodness of fit, 3%. If you turned up at the Treasury and said to Andy, hey, I've got an unemployment model, and can predict unemployment within plus or minus 6 percentage points one year ahead, don't think he's going to be terribly impressed. And they kind of get that idea. They also begin to understand that R squared is useless. This statistic, you need to test this is a relationship, that's about all it tells you. And then we get down to the serious stuff. We're going to discuss dot of correlation in the model. We've now discussed the residuals and show huge rejection. Uh, arch may or may not come in. Normality is strongly rejected, so this isn't a regression. Whatever this is, it may be a best fit in one, it ain't no regression. There's no heteroscedasticity. So, with each of these, we spend time in the theory, we explain how it's done, and we relate it to the underlying properties. And there's the graph. And you can see from the graph that the residuals are just about as autocorrelated as the original data. Whenever our variable is taken out, it has not dealt with the time component. So this is not a concrete model. We're not matching in all respects. Normality is pretty iffy compared for the residuals as well. And you can see the model does quite well like the graph earlier. And you can relate this back to the graph. But the residuals are pretty dreadful and certainly are random. Now we've done multiple testing. So you can introduce some concepts underlying multiple testing. Does it work? Why does it work? What's happening here? It's clear the model is badly specified. What do you do about it? Do you do some idiotic, well, let's add in another variable to correct it? Or do you rethink to try and come up with a model that would actually characterize the data? Another simple model would just be to estimate the autoregression. Look at that. It fits twice as well. That means it's competitive, that's the old time series versus econometrics debates in the 60s, so maybe you need to combine these. Still not congruent, and one can go on and discuss that. There's the graph of the utter regression, and you can see it's always wrong, but never wrong by so much. There's a clear outlier in the crash of 22, massive increase in unemployment. The utter correlation is much better, the amount of residuals better, but still not perfect. So that lets us introduce the combined model, which is both the unemployment on its determinant and like unemployment and the need to think of dynamics. We spend about a week discussing dynamics, solution of dynamic models. We're now getting quite close to congruence. There's a little bit of heteroscedasticity because we haven't modeled the logic and we can discuss that. And the long run solution is really interesting. We can solve this and you'll see it's 5% plus. A, one, a unit coefficient on this effect, and that lets you introduce discussions of if you run static regressions when they're not an appropriate thing, you get badly biased estimates, you can introduce the concept of regression bias against a model. This is now the fit, vastly better, it's still not perfect, there's still things that could be picked up, and we have a GD outliers. Now we already discussed constancy, I mean, now go on into it recursively. They've got the idea they can fit 10 regression lines. Why not fit to the first 10, the first 11, the first 12, the first 13, all the way through? And, of course, that's very easily done. And you get these graphs of all the coefficients at the different points in time. What did the investigators found in 1890? What were they found in 1920? What were they found in 1918? If had this data set. Astonishingly, it's never rejected on one step or multiple step tests, so it doesn't look fantastically constant, that's, but that has to be sampling variability. And then students are asked to come up with their theories. Is it real wages? Is it trade union power? And we test them against this model as we proceed with their formulations. So 
So they've seen how stupid it is to fit simple models. They've seen that multiple testing isn't problematic. We then spend some time discussing model selection. Model selection occurs every time you look at a test and you make a decision. So it's absolutely ubiquitous. I've never, ever seen any econometric study that didn't involve model selection. Usually in a cat-handed, unstructured, and completely hopeless way, because the investigator denies the validity of doing it properly for reasons that I have no understanding of. So how would you do it properly? You do it properly by starting with the most general model that encompasses all the previous evidence, all the theoretical considerations, and took into account all the data, and you're trying to handle that. So they're going to have to confront big models. They're going to go out there and work, these kids. They're not going to be academics, most of them. They're going to be something serious. And run regressions for hedge funds. Probably not now. They didn't pass that back to one of their employers. And people like that. And they need to understand what they're doing. So model selection. Two decisions. Do you keep a variable or do you drop it? Two states. Was it relevant or was it irrelevant? Four possible outcomes, which one can then discuss. So how do we discuss it? Well, let's imagine a world in which you've got a perfect orthogonal regression model with a thousand variables. They're never going to be able to do that by hand, but many of the people I know are now doing that. 50,000 is the biggest we have done. And very shortly, if there's a moment, I'll run 400 for you live. If it's orthogonal, then all the z's are non-cross-correlated. And the fog reality doesn't matter, it's easiest to explain it. Square the t-statistics to get rid of the sign. Estimate the general model, and then order the t-statistic from the biggest to the smallest. Then you tell me, oh, I like t-squares of 4, or 9, or whatever your favourite cutoff point is. So anything above that is in, and everything below that is out. And so little n is the number of variables you will keep. And it might cross your mind, you've done one, and only one test. And that test is a comparison of the margin between the margin volumes. Ordering doesn't change anything. You make one decision, not two to the power of a thousand, which is what would happen if you did bit or something silly like that, which is 10 to the 300 possible models, which you cannot choose between. That's an impossible color. The huge breakthrough is coming in model selection is to realize you can do it with one decision. That's all. Put in a thousand variables, tell me your cutoff. We know what's in, and therefore what's out. We know what's out, therefore what's in. That's it. It's all over. You picked your model, but you haven't done multiple testing. Now, of course, there's multiple sampling. These t squares could cross over. You could get a set of data that moved it a bit smaller, or this one moved it a bit bigger. So you very closely at the t squares near the critical value, but all the others you can forget about. Now, of course, if they're highly correlated, you've got to search to find what the orthogonal representation of the model is. And that's where all the search comes in. We maintain how many variables we keep, however big the model, at about one. This is irrelevant, falsely retained variables, by setting the critical value at roughly one upon the number of variables. So if you've got a thousand variables, we set it to one in a thousand. Now, because we're building congruent models that are approximately normal, that's like a T of T and a half. We're not being very demanding. But if we choose that critical value and the corresponding T, and all thousands were irrelevant, we'd keep one by chance. If you begin with a thousand bits of ignorance, and you'd end with one bit of ignorance. On a massive reduction in your uncertainty, almost costlessly. T's of two probably wouldn't be picked up, but then they're not very important. So, let me do this. Um, so this is a very famous data set because it was the one that I released with the original version <coughs> of PC Gimlet when it first came out. And I'm going to put in only one light matters. I'm going to put in 20 just to get enough variables. And in addition to the four variables that actually matter, we've got 20 irrelevant white noise variables. There's only 120 data points. I'm going to put in 400 variables. Most of you told your class, you can't do this. Let me assure you now, this is trivial to do. No problem at all. So the model, oops.
model now is absolutely gigantic. You've never estimated a model as big as this, although many of my students have. But we teach them that they can't do this, but a computer program can actually do this without a great deal of difficulty. Let's pick a tiny model. I want to outline detection at this stage. And that's it done it. That's it tried all to tell us somewhere up here how many variables, was 400 and something for 120 data points. That is the right answer. That is the data generation process we used when we created this data back in 1984. That's how it was generated. Now, we do explain to our students how we can do this, and we also explain to them how to put a dummy variable for every observation. Because these are new techniques that they will need to use when they get out there. Because most people think you can't estimate models like this, and if you want to know how to do it, I suggest <laughs> that you with modern econometrics, reading that, or, alternatively, reading the PC book, both of which explain how easy it is to do this, and how easy to get students to do it. Now, what we do with them next is, of course, to get them to simulate the program. Everyone in the room generates artificial data. All get different samples. Everybody estimates from their sample using autometrics. Then we write up the board how many got the right answer, how many different by one, etc. It's always roughly everybody in the room gets the right answer. And that's what we expect from the theory. Right? If T's are two, they won't do it, because students never think of that with big T space, and the relative variables are easily removed. So now they can handle complicated models in the face of quite complicated non-stationary data. So we didn't expect the next slide to be conclusions, but it did. I think if you do this in the classroom, the hours are better than average, but they're very non-mathematical, and at the end of the course, they've got enough ability both to read the literature, critically evaluate it, and if you give them exercises, here's a data set, go model, they will come back admittedly using autometrics, with really sensible models to set up something general, with testing for all the various non-stationarities, and they have a genuine understanding of what 